All right, so we're going to get started here this morning. A few housekeeping chores. And um, what's going on here is we have tomorrow, we're going to be up at the Performance Center in Ridgefield with Heath, Heath Wassum. He's going to do his uh, top tracer, as well as Carl Alexander, who's going to give us some stuff that he's been working on with uh, Rob LeBritz in his time out on the Champions Tour. We have the assistance meeting coming up on Monday, which will be April 11th. Right. We have the educational meeting coming up or the educational seminar, I should say, at the Westchester Country Club. That'll be on uh, Tuesday, the 12th, which is the Tuesday after the master. So, you know, both of those have registration uh, on the Met section site. And then our April meeting we have coming up on the 20th at Brayburn. So, you know, feel free to get on there to register for those. And and we'll go from there. Uh, if you're not muted, please do so. If you have any questions while uh, for Paul while we're going through here for the next couple uh -huh. of hours, you feel free to put them in your uh, right. your queue yeah. down there. You can type them in the queue. Where are you going to get fit? Uh, somebody needs to uh, to mute themselves, please. And you can put your questions in the queue. I'll bring them up and and we'll go from there. Uh, one of the things that I've seen of the last few weeks, I've been going around to some of the different clubs. I do some. Uh, aim point clinics and so I'm out there talking with professionals checking clubs is that everybody is suffering from the same thing it seems everybody needs staff you know from golf professional staff to outside operations staff I know Greg, Greg Bisconti over at St. Andrews is looking for for somebody for the shop for merchandising and taking care of the shop so it, it seems to be widespread through throughout that everybody's going uh, on on searches for personnel so we will obviously want to uh, let you know that you're not alone when you're out there doing that. And the other thing it seems to be, which we'll get into Paul with a little bit, that there's a, there's a shortage in the supply chains, okay? So everybody seems to be uh, in the same boat when it comes to supply chains, that uh, we're, we're having a shortage of range balls. I've heard uh, wedges, bags, a lot of shops have, uh, Merchandise coming in, but everybody seems to be short on shirts. And I'm talking when I everybody I'm, I'm talking. I've, I've visited maybe six to twelve clubs, so uh, this seems to be something that's that's going on on a regular basis. Uh, ask them if you could take your video off there. That'd be good. Paul, you're on, so we're going to put Paul up. All right. So Paul Farone, good morning. How are you doing? Paul, you need to unmute. How's that? Yeah, it's much better. We can hear you now, which is always okay. a pleasure. Hi. All right. So you're at your studio there at Downtown Golf in Stanford, yes. Connecticut. Yes, I right. am. And um, what type of season have you seen so far? You, you're obviously, you know, you're in the fitting business as, as well as, you know, you have an indoor studio there that you can teach using your foresight technology. Uh, how have how have fittings been going here in the last four to six weeks? Uh, busy. And then I would say everybody's still pretty demanding as far as wanting it right away. That's um, not a that's not something that happens anymore right away. Well, you gotta be I I I find I'm building a lot more of you know because you have stock. Yeah. So I I have a lot of iron sets. Um, I, I've got my the bulk of my spring inventory, so um, I got a lot of stuff. And so if anybody are... needs left-handed, tailor-made putters, just know I have plenty. So I, a... I, Rick, Rick has supplied me with at least fifteen left-handed tailor-made putters. You're all set. From a fitting standpoint, what are what are the supply chains like for you? What are you having problems getting? I've heard people having trouble with grips. I mean, I've seen that on the uh, the website, you know, the Met unofficial website, Facebook page that, you know, people are looking for grips. People are looking for, you know, obviously you don't do apparel, but uh, grips, shafts. What are you yeah. seeing? So, yeah, grips and shafts are, are difficult to get. Um, not only aftermarket but from the manufacturer so uh, i'm sure some of you are getting emails and notified that 
certain shafts are coming right out of the matrixes. So you're pulling different shafts out of the matrix. And I think one of the ways you have to start looking at how you're going to fit somebody is to find out what's available. So that's, you know, when somebody tells you their time frame is, is going to be a couple weeks, you may have to go to a manufacturer that, you know, can get it in a couple weeks. So you're obviously limited by what you can fit with. Right. And then I, I think, you know, most people are amenable to changing their grip to take something that they might not want, but boy, to find a multi-compound grip, it's, it's, it's not easy. And what are your suppliers telling you as far as time? They don't, they can't even give me an answer. So I, I know I've had um, cases of grips on order for well over seven months and I'm not getting them. And they have, back no, to the fall. they have no answer to whether you're getting it or not. I see just up in the air. The other thing I've, uh, I've heard is wedges are hard to come by. What, what has your experience been there? Um, no, I, I, I haven't had any problem with wedges. I have a lot of wedges and did you, you did a lot of pre-ordering. I did a lot of pre-ordering. Um, I, I will have a big bulky order coming in shortly. And, uh, in fact, Jay is checking on that right now. So I, I, I'll be fine with wedges, but I, I do sell a lot of wedges and I usually always have a big inventory of wedges. I think, um, I think Cleveland you can still get a lot of wedges from. So I, I, I haven't seen a problem. Callaway's got them. So yeah, wedges, not a problem. And as far as, um, as far as the, the clients and their attitude toward waiting four to six weeks, is that, is that a norm? That's the window we had talked about previously. Are you still seeing that four to six week window on, on like, say, if I order a set of irons, if I get custom fit by you? Depending on the manufacturer, even longer. Uh, I have I have thirty or forty sets of irons in stock, so I'm just building what I have. And then if, if I find you know if I find out that it's going to be a longer period of time, I'll either build them or I'll um, I'll order them from the company. You, you got to feel it out with the person and see if they're willing to wait. You, you don't want to lose the sale because they don't want to you know they don't want to wait. But I don't know where they're going to get it otherwise. So right, so they're not. It's not like they can go down the street. I've had, I've had a few clients who've gone and, and bought used sets after getting fitted, placing the order, and then saying, ah, you know, I found it online. Will you adjust it to this measurements? And I've been, yeah, fine. It's, you know, whatever you get fastest. Right. So, you know, obviously through the pandemic, the golf industry has had quite a surge in playing, in fitting, in course usage. And on the flip side of it, the, the merchandise end of it has already taken a hit because the supply chains from overseas are just backlogged to no end. So do you think this has started the start of something new in the way we're going to be doing business going forward? Yeah, I think, you know, as it stands out, none of the companies want to really answer the phone. So they're all converting, it looks like, to email. So it looks like every, every, every confrontation you have or every um, communication you have with the manufacturer is all by email. And sometimes it takes the whole day or the next day to get an answer on, you know, a simple question like, when are these coming? And even those answers aren't guaranteed. We expect the shafts by 515. We expect them to go to production two weeks after. And then you'll get notification that it's been pushed back. So, so I think it's a new normal. I think, it, it, you know, just how you started the whole seminar here um, with guys having trouble finding help. I think the manufacturer is having trouble finding help. I think the, you know, whoever's delivering the product is having every, every chain where, where a person is involved, nobody can fill that position. I know. I, it seems like uh, I was in a, a store the other day with one of my daughters, and she said to me, she says, you know, every time we go into a store and we leave the store, we see a sign there. Look, everybody wants to hire somebody, don't they? You know, and like she's 14, but you know, you know, Tori, like she's very inquisitive. And I said, right. I said, no matter where you go, everybody's in the same situation. They don't have enough staff. Yeah. You know, restaurants, food stores, you know, clothing stores, everybody's the same way. Everybody's hiring. And, it's, and so I, I would think in your position, because you do a lot of building, 
you're going to have to start looking already at, at your, your late summer fall orders at this point and start getting stuff in the pipeline going forward. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm curious or I'm worried that the wave of stuff I have now, once it's gone, am I going to get it back? You know, am I going to be able to replenish it? Are you going to be able to stay in business late in the year? Right. Am I, am I going to be able to resupply it? And then if I am, do I have to order it now to have it, you know, for that June and July run of, of, uh, of, of clients? Right. I would, uh, I would say yes. Right. From everything I'm seeing from everybody I'm talking to, I'm, uh, I'm surprised because typically these shops that I've been going into by the second week in March, third week in March, you know, everything's in, they're full of boxes, everything's on hangers, you know, everybody's steaming something. And, and I'm not seeing that. I have not seen one shop that is completely set up and full right now. It's just, you know, it all looks like January to me when I walk into these shops or it's just a scarcity of materials. And uh, the golf professionals I'm talking to all have the same thing. They're not sure when they're going to see their product. Yeah, I, I ordered gloves. I, I bet you it was seven months ago. And I, I got them recently. Uh, and I know that uh, once these are gone, these are gone. The Titleist, Titleist Players Gloves. So if I want my dozen gloves, I should get up there quickly? Get up there quick, John. <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're going fast, right? All right. So when we start talking about fitting here and, and what you're doing there, um, oftentimes I've had the, the opportunity to come up to the shop and watch you fit people. And we often talk about when you're fitting, you want to always deliver the club to the ball in a level position at impact. I hear you say that a lot in, in when you're talking to your clients and, and how you do that. So what what are you seeing with your fitting process that allows that to happen? And could you explain what you mean by that to, to our attendees this morning? Uh, well, as far as, you know, shuffling in different lie angles, different shafts, uh, different lengths, you, you can sometimes watch somebody hit, you know, 15, 20 shots and every one of them is on the toe and then the club, you know, the club is seven, eight degrees downward. And by trying the different combinations, you'll see you can start pulling impact. You know, it may not seem like that's what he needs, but as long as you pull the club, you know, get the club more level to the ground, you'll start pulling impact more towards the center. Now, of course, you have to look at the way the guy swings. Obviously, that could be a player who's going up and going away from it. And that's when you may have to step in or that's when I would step in and start coaching a little bit. And, uh, you know, that's how I get through a lot of fittings. Because you've got to, you've got to find them some kind of semblance of impact in order to fit them properly. Well, you know, if, if somebody walks in here and says, I'm only hitting my seven iron 170 yards and, and none of the shots are on the center. All you got to do is draw the hit to the center to see it go 150 all of a sudden. And then, you know, then you kind of own the guy. And then you, then you have him. Now, was that part of the club or was it part of, you instructing him. Well, a lot of times it's part of you instructing him. Right. So they have a better understanding of what's going on with their swing shape. Right. For the people that come in to see you for fitting, is there a common theme as, as to what the, your average fitting is looking for? I mean, what is it that you hear on a, on a day-to-day -day basis? 95% of the time consistency. Everybody wants consistency. It's not that you think it's distance, although you hear that, but more often than not, people want more, they want to be more consistent. And, you know, how do you get them more consistent? You try and draw more hits to the center of the face. And what do you find like when the, when this, let's say I'm that person and I walk in and, uh, you know, in my case, I want more distance and consistency, by the way. So, <laughs> sure, I'm, 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 yeah, why not? Yeah. Why not? I'm going to be the difficult person, right? And so, um, so what do you find when that person's inconsistent? Do you find that it's it's a combination of of swing shape and fitting? Is it more fitting, or you know, how often do those clubs fit properly? Um, clubs are fit properly. I would say that for the most part, 
you don't see clubs upright enough for most players. And, I, you know, one of the things that I'm going to do is because, you know, you have the information that Foresight gives you. I'm going to explain to them why their ball always goes left or why it goes right, um, why it's not going far enough. And then I'd like to show them what to expect from their club speed. So if they are swinging 100 miles an hour and, you know, their, their tee shot's going 220 yards, I try, and, I try and show them how at that club speed it can go considerably further. And uh, I'll relate to them some of the data um, that the manufacturers provide to show them, look at this club speed, this is how far the ball can go, and then try and correct the inefficiency. And what about what about the person's uh, physical abilities as far as you know strength? I, I think that you look you're, you're seeing that in how fast they're swinging the club, right? You know, right. and then with um, you know somebody will tell you I have a bad back or I have a you know a, something wrong with my leg or shoulder. Uh, that's always important to know as well. Yeah, because, you know, I see a lot of people here, you know, I teach throughout the winter in the city in an indoor academy, and and I, I hear the same thing about consistency and distance. I think people have this misconception that they're longer than what they actually are. And then when they hit a shot on our simulators and it goes X amount of distance, they always look at me and say, well, I'm much longer on the golf course. And I said, well, everybody is. Everybody is, is so much longer on the golf course. I said, you know, sometimes being indoors inhibits the motion. And I said, here, you're just seeing the carry distance. You're not seeing as much roll on a simulator as you'd see outdoors, you know, and, and kind of soften the blow like that. But do you see a lot of people that don't understand how far their clubs go? I would say more often than not, most people, the first thing I'll ask is how far do they carry the ball? And everybody gives me total distance. Or more, yes. more so than not. And usually they're, they're pretty right about that. You know, a lot of times guys on oh, my seven iron goes 150 yards and there it is. It, it flies 136 yards and then it rolls out the rest. And you'll see 150. So right. knowing that and knowing that he's used to playing that way is helpful in the fitting process. Sure. So now as you, as you look at the way he's going to play the game, you might look at it as, oh, he's going to, he's playing, or, or, you know, to roll it out. So if your error with your spin rate on the low side, that guy still might be happy with that ball flight because he's looking at it from a total distance standpoint. Mm -hmm. And in your fitting process, uh, let's call it low hanging fruit. Where can you make the biggest difference with, with the fitting process, with the data that you're getting off your foresight? I'm not sure I understand the question, John. What do you mean? Uh, I come in there and let's say I'm hitting my seven iron 138 yards, right? And would like to get me another 10 to 12 yards. And you're looking at the data and how, how does like in the iron fitting, how is the spin rate? What do you look at with spin rates in that situation? Uh, okay. Well, so I, I guess I'd always look at uh, the apex of the shot. Can you see that screen at all? We color. can. So as I go into some swings I have here, um, so I, I might look at the efficiency there and, you know, 85 miles an hour at a one, three, four, one, three, seven, one, three. So I might've maxed out that player if I'm looking at that type of efficiency. Now, if, if the efficiency number is below 1.3, um, then I would I would work to increase that. And once I, I guess I saw numbers like that, I probably think that, that that's as good as you're going to do. Based on the equipment on, and the physical ability on, at this time. Right. Based on ball speed divided by club speed, you certainly would have to look at the apex of the shots, the descent. You know, you, you look at that series of shots there. I don't know if you can read this, but I've got a series of shots with a backspin at 5,300, 54, then there's one at 48. Now, for all I know, I've got a, a low spinning ball in there, and that could be just an outlier. But I'll always go to the average anyway and look at the line along the bottom. So is it descending between 45 and 50 degrees? Are the RPMs at 5,500 or above? 
Um, and then is the ball over 30 yards high? Yeah, that, that's kind of what I'm fitting for to get those numbers. And I think once you get, again, you might change that based on what the guy's looking for. If he's telling you he wants it rolled out, then you might look at a different. Different a, way a different to go about that. But, yeah. <clears throat> and, and so that's the, that's the beauty of having something like a foresight launch monitor at your disposal, right? Because yeah, you know, you're getting, you're getting really good data. Well, it, it's a language that I'm used to looking at. You know, I, I'm used to this and other guys are used to track man and whichever one you use, whichever one you have is the best one, but whichever one you, you're used to the language of, you know, this right. is, this is me hitting a driver here and I'll, I'll cover up the swing speed out of embarrassment. But if you look at the impact marks, this is me. I'm, I'm always on the bottom of the club. And why am I on the bottom of the club? Because I'm six degrees upward and my ball is probably too far forward. Well, I know that in the data. Do you know what I mean? I, I know that in the data. And um, you know, my phone's ringing. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like looking at, that's why, like I said, I'm used to looking at the foresight uh, information. Right. No. Okay. So, like in your own case, that's your swing shape. Yep. And that's not going to change. Um, unless I stop building clubs and doing seminars, John. Hey, there's an idea. You might stop building clubs in July, so don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so then when you see that, then you're going to obviously have to uh, adjust your possibly your ball position your setup your address position you know to accommodate that motion could be t height too could be t height right exactly so so that's the beauty of being able to fit with something like that as if you go back you know because you know you and i go back you know multiple decades now amazing isn't it uh, mm -hmm. and you're still very young looking compared to me good job on your end healthy eating <clears throat> good lifestyle <clears throat> so let's go back 25 30 years right when when we met back in the 90s and what do what do you see over the last couple of you know decades of of club fitting how much it's changed because of of this technology right it's like you there's no guesswork for you anymore isn't it? it's just interpretation of data well you're interpreting data but you're always looking you, you always have to look at the different clubs like when when somebody walks in, you want to see their equipment. Okay, right. at least I want to see their equipment. And then I want to see that hard average of, of spins and ball flight. And from that, it's easy to say, oh, I can eliminate this driver. Okay, and then a lot of times with me, it's the, it's the, the hosel connection, the way the tailor-made hosel works different than the Callaway hosel. It seems to affect ball flight left or right more than the other. And that might be a reason I go to that one. But it depends on what you have to do to go, you know, from, from their current driver. And then that sort of points you in the direction. And then you have to know what the different clubs do. Like that new stealth driver doesn't spin much. So it, at the slower club speeds, you're going to definitely be looking at higher loft. I got to believe with that driver. Higher loft and softer tip shafts. In order to facilitate the... Right, and to keep a, the, the knuckle... strength of the driver, right. What are you... Uh... What are you currently fitting driver wise, at, you know, across the board? What what seems to be some of your go tos that that seem to have a wide range of fitting capabilities? Everybody wants to hit the stealth right now. So that's that's one thing that people are definitely interested in. Uh, so so I, I'll do a lot of fitting with the stealth. Um, again, it, it's more a function of the type of player you see. And, you know, as to which one is a go-to or not, which one has more fitting capabilities. I, I don't know if there's, you know, I might say the Callaway because they have an adjustable hosel to where I can uh, lower loft two degrees or add loft two degrees. And I might be substituting a, a, a hosel like that. Um, so that might make that club more beneficial. Um, for the guy who's, you know, hooking the ball. Well, you, you, you put that tailor-made in a lower setting and it's hard to hit it left because the face just seems to get so open with that with that type of hosel. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, it's not really a go-to. You know, the the ping driver seems to go pretty straight, and 
um, if, if that's what you find the players looking for, that might be the best option for them. So, so that's a good attribute to have. Uh, yeah. Ryan George had a question about: uh, Is there a max uh, upright that you'll fit a player as far as lie angle? That's what I imagine. Uh, yeah, I, I will. Uh, I, I guess, I guess I've gone four and five degrees upright. I, I don't go much more than that. Um, again, I. I would try and substitute length in to offset how long I or how upright I have to go. All right, so you and I, uh, you and I have it's a. It's a ahead. question again. Which, whichever one is is looking to, um, you know, you want ball flight to be the most important thing, and if the lie is too flat or upright, and he still likes the ball flight from it, then who cares what the lie angle really is? Right. Do you uh, do you do you tend to fit more upright than flat? You know, when you're looking at the bulk of your clients. Yeah, and then I'll I inventory my clubs more upright too, just because it's easier to bend them flatter. So I would say all the sets I have in the shop are all two degrees uh, upright, and then if I do have somebody I fit that's flatter, then I can it's it's easier to go down than it is to go up. So I could use it, still get it to two degrees flat if I had to. So like you're ordering up. you're ordering your sets a couple of degrees upright to begin with, knowing that the bulk of your players are going to need that. Yeah, and then <clears throat> the, the the bulk of the the clubs I have are going to be easier to bend to. What do you find easiest to bend? You well, know, the, the softer metals. So I mean, if you look at the the Cali Apex series, would be easy to bend the. Uh, the 790s, the Taylor made 790 being easy set to bend. The 770s are easy to bend. All the pings are easy to bend. Um, the Titleist irons pretty easy to bend. The T100, the T100 pretty easy to bend. So that's good inventory for me to have the harder ones, the harder metals. I um, so the Stealth doesn't seem to want to bend so much, but I try not to keep so many of those in at um, you know in stock because it's just a specific person for the most part that's fine that it's got to match up to what I have in the, in the store. Mm -hmm. And then when you're, uh, how does angle of attack fit in with your fittings? Uh, well, angle of attack probably be more important when I look at the wedges, but um, it, it's important to know what the low point of the club is. So you know, when you see that guy walk in, make four or five swings for you, never hits the turf, and it's a three degree upward attack, you can start drawing the conclusion that guy's going to hit some fat shots. And he, he, you know, the low point is prior to impact. Uh, he's usually got the club head's going to be ahead of his hands. He's usually got a higher launch angle. He usually has a lower impact position on the face. And, you know, from that, you, that's going to affect what sole you're using and, and, and what loft you're going to put them in as far as the iron's going to be. So it's important. You know, the, I think that you're looking from four degrees downward or so looks like the, the, the perfect, um, uh, you, you know, a specific number for the, the better player seems to have who's taken a normal divot. You'll see a guy at seven degrees, eight degrees downward. Um, he's going to need a wider sole club usually in that case, so he's not peeling out so much turf. So it's and, important to know, it's, it's good information. Right, so that's one of your go-to numbers with your foresight? It's important, yeah. And, um, and, and looking you, at the driver, you, know, you, you can see that guy come in that's eight degrees outside and four degrees downward, that's spinning the ball. There's only, unless you change the swing, there's almost nothing I can do. Which is? To change, to change those numbers. Right. So that, you know, so then the fitting turns into a lesson. Well, it might turn into a lesson. It might turn into showing him, you know, a lower spinning ball and um, showing him what he's capable of and what he's losing. But, and do you, do you see that, are the clients surprised about the information that when you share it with them? Is it like. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes I, you got to read the person too. I, I think I can get overwhelming with it. So I, I try to back off with some of the players. And so it's how, much, kind of, which how much information you give them, how much you're going to give them. And do you tend to see uh, with various, which, obviously the handicap of the player is going to affect the fitting. 
right? Do you send, tend to see different attack angles, different uh, path angles with certain groups of handicaps? Like if, you know, let's take everybody's championship flight at the golf club, right? So, you know, the, the guys who are, you know, anywhere from plus to, you know, let's say six, you know, plus to a, to a, a six handicap. What are you going to see in that group? What are you going to see swing path wise? What are you going to see club face wise? I would tell you the straighter hitters, John, are swinging down the target line. And so you're seeing the low and numbers? Then, and you're seeing what? Are you seeing low numbers relative to yeah. path and you, face? You'll, you'll see low numbers. You'll see, um, again, the lower handicaps are matching pace, uh, face to path the best. Right. Um, the, um, as you get a, to a higher handicap, you, you don't see higher handicaps go from inside to outside really either. You, you know, you, you, they have one specific um, path, you know, one average. They're always four degrees outside. You know, you never see them drop four degrees inside usually, at least in the time you have them here. Right. Right. Which and obviously... then I, I would say the higher the handicap gets, not, not just that the club path is so bad, it's really... It's really the understanding of how to hit a golf ball that seems to be the biggest struggle to most of the players. They don't, how many times have I said to somebody, okay, let's see if we can't swing to the right of the target line, for, for example. Everybody thinks the ball's gonna go to the right if they swing the club face to the right. Or the swing, you know, swing the club in that direction. And, and you know, I keep telling them, well, the face is going to have a bigger influence on the flight of the ball and which direction that's aimed. And so many times nobody knows that answer. So I think from a fitting and instruction job, that's, that's you know, I, I try to get them to understand the, the ball flight laws and the nine directions the ball is going to go and try to show them who they are on that. And, um, yeah, I go from there. All right, so... So they're not as knowledgeable as you'd expect them to be, given they've been playing 15, 20 years of golf. Yeah, no, absolutely not. All right. And so obviously that has a lot to do with your ability to fit them is, is to start changing, you know, patterns or shape. I would think it's a, an advantage, you know, uh, if you're a golf professional and you're fitting, and if you're fitting at, at a range, you know, at a, at, at a club where you have a range, and you can set up all these different parameters. Like you might set up, you know, a draw station, like how to draw the golf ball, right? Which would probably be the most popular station on your range. But you just alluding to the things that you said, like here's where you put your feet, here's where you put the ball. And then you build some kind of like, what I like to do is some kind of barricades, you know, with, you know, cardboard boxes or something they could hit where they're not gonna hurt themselves or their club, but just to change swing shapes. Yeah, I, I I think that was um, um, that would you know one thing I don't see in a driving range you know a grass driving range I never see contours on the range that they're always flat I don't understand why they don't build some contours into a section of the range so people would be able to go and do that to practice the side hill the downhill ball below my feet ball above my feet right anytime I'm on a grass range I always end up on either the the, the side where it banks down, because typically uh, grass ranges sit a little higher than the surrounding ground. And when I was teaching on grass ranges, I try to, you know, if, I, if I'm trying to get that, you know, curving ball right to left for the right hander, I always go the far left side where I get the ball above their feet where they can't be as upright in their delivery where they have to shallow the club out, where they have to swing a little more around themselves. But I think that's a really good point is just like, why not have a, an area of the range if you have the space where you can create the uneven lines? Yeah. That's, a, that's the beauty of some of these short game areas, like you know what Rob Britz has up at you know, Glen Arbor with that short game area. It's just you know, magnificent. You know, so, which again gets into your wedge fittings, right? And being sure. with a, a big advantage when you're fitting outside is to, to you know, be out on, the, on those different uh, surfaces, uh, different grasses, different slopes to fit your wedges properly. Oh yeah, I, I would have. I would think if I were out there, I'd have a full bag with um, every every type of sole, and it'd be something you could use year after year. 
you know, it's not like you'd have to, you know, to, to show somebody the bounce, you could continually use a K grind, right? From uh, from Vokey for, for years to, to show everybody how different that sole would work relative to an M grind. What about the, you know, speaking of grinds on wedges, so obviously the types of turf that people are playing on, the lengths of grasses that they're playing on, how their courses are manicured with, with those lengths of grasses, do they understand, do your clients understand what bounce is and why, you know, low bounce on tight lies and more bounce on, on fluffier lies, uh, which is all things, again, you could do it at your facility, right? Well, you know, I, for the tight lie, I might put a lie board down and give them, you know, tape up the sole and then give them, um, say, a high bounce wedge, say a K grind, have them try and hit it and watch them skull it, skull it, skull it, and then go to a lower grind. Say, so look, when you have this lie, now you, you can show them where they're making contact towards a trailing edge and then work for, towards different grinds to get them to the middle of the golf club. Right, so you can, you obviously you have the ability to. I would fit simulate around. it. I would simulate the lie as best yeah, I could. Yeah, indoors. Yeah. Right. Right. That makes good sense. Do you, Do you find most people buy wedges by what they think they like, or or are they fitted properly when they when you first see them? Um, most, I think most people buy based on loft than anything else. So, so they'll sit there and say, well, my, my um, pitching wedge is 45, and then I need a 50, and then I need a 54, and then I need a 58. Right. And I think more of them look at it in terms of, of loft than anything else. Rather than else. bounce. Rather than bounce, rather how they're going to, you know, you, you have to understand how they're going to use the sole. It, it would be rare for me to sell the sand wedge that comes with a set. And I actually sold the set yesterday with, the sand wedge that came, a set of rogues with the sand wedge that went over the set because he's never going to use it other than a club that goes 10 yards shorter than the gap wedge. Right. He's never going to use it in a bunker. Yes, I always use a lob wedge in a bunker. So once you knew that, then that's a perfect choice for him. Right. Makes sense. And so you got to, you got to fit the, with obviously the, you know, which I think is an advantage for the club professional because especially if you have a membership, you know, and you can go out and see on turf on sand with what they're doing oh sure they you know they you know at, at a club you, you know those guys and i would think you everybody has a catalog of what everybody does by now you know they you know you would you would i would think that everybody knows how fast john smith swings and uh you know they they're specific to his numbers and certainly going into a lesson I would say, okay, I'm going to give a lesson to a guy who swings 100 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour. And I would almost think I'd be going out there with tools for that, that player, whether it's different driver shafts or um, iron shafts or something, um, just to maybe during the lesson, get a, get a sale. <laughs> or during the fitting, get a lesson. Right, right. Um, one of the things that I think is, is like really interesting is to – are bunker lessons, right? Because I I see a lot of really bad bunker players because they don't know how the club's supposed to interact with the sand. Do you see that when your fittings, like do people talk about their bunker play? Uh, yep. Yep. People are confused on the setup of it. Um, I think that is a big proponent why people are poor in the bunkers, at least what I see. Um, ooh, I read an article that somebody took out the, the Arco system for a period of time and used it and analyzed all the data. And he said, I'll never practice in the bunker based on the information that I got from Arcos. And he said, I'm serviceable in the bunker, but it doesn't cost me any shots. Right. So I, I can get it out. It's not a big deal. It really doesn't cost me as much based on the, on the data. Right. I thought that was fascinating. Right. Well, yeah, I think if most people, if most people can extract themselves from the bunker in one shot and be putting the next shot, they're probably happy. Yeah, I agree. Right. Uh, Tyler had a question. 
do you ever fit lie angle to someone's miss? Go flatter if they're always missing left. So they're fit lie angle to what? You'd fit the lie angle to the miss. So like, if you have somebody that's always missing left. Oh God, yes, yes, of course. Yeah, myself. So your... My clubs are four degrees flat. I don't want to hook it. <laughs> I don't think Tyler was expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I, I think wall flight is is the most important, um, you know, reason. If you if you like the ball flight from that, uh, I I would tell you I would I would I would be selling that player a club I could adjust down the road. So if I did change his golf swing later, um, you know, I'd want the ability to change that. Right. But, yep. yep. I, you know, I did a fitting last week for somebody. I don't even know why I was fitting him, but he. He he needed a club that was more upright than standard, and somehow he associated the fact that he needed something more upright with something he was doing wrong. And I said, "Well, no, that's just the way your club comes back to the ball better, so two or three degrees up, whatever it was." And he bought the set to a, a standard lie angle, and I thought, "Well." Why are you doing that? Why do you want to do it that way? I said, what do you need me for? And he said, well, I just want that to be out of the cage. I want to fit my, fix my swing before I do anything else. And I tried to explain to him that wasn't the issue, but he wouldn't hear of it. So I um, I got, that, I got that brings up an interesting point because I run into that all the time, especially indoors inside here, you know, during the winter, because you're not seeing ball flight for more than 10 feet, but obviously the just like on your screen there, it picks it up. So, you know, for most of the people I teach, I'm attempting to get more inside path, more club face closure because they're outside open face, you know, and obviously weak fade slices, right? So I, I see a little more of that, be, a little more over the top type, you know, with the clientele that I see here in the city. And so then we'll work for, you know, for weeks on end, and I'll get them into more of a, you know, and I'll put bags down to kind of create a little area where they can't hit. If they go outside in, they're going to hit the bag. And so eventually we get the inside out draw pattern. And then, you know, once I get the path better, I get, then I'll work on a face. That's my preference. Mm -hmm. You could go, you could go face path. That's fine too. That's just my preference. You know, I go, I go path face. And then, then I have them aim right. And as soon as I have them aim right, they have a problem with that. And they hmm. said, well, well I, I shouldn't have to do that. I should be a better player. I said, no, the ball curves. I said, why would it make sense to aim at the target if your curves away from the target with a draw pattern? And I said, and if you had a fade pattern, I'd aim left to target. So the ball's always working toward the target. Well, but that's not what better players do. And I said, no, that is what better players do. Right. But somehow people have an idea that if, if you make a club a little, if you make a club fit them properly, or if you aim them anywhere but at the flag, you're doing them a disservice. Yeah, it happens all the time. If, if you I, don't have success with what you just mentioned you're doing right away, he'll revert right back to what he always did. He'll just go right back to setting up square and, and peeling it off to the right. And, right. And I just have a hard time with and, this individual to get them to see the reality. It's like it's a side-on game. How often do you hit a ball straight? Yes. Yes. You know, I, um, again, working on a simulator. So you're, you're putting a line on where the ball starts to where the ball ends. Correct. And I believe it's with the seven iron at, at 400 RPMs of side spin, you can't see that outside. All right. You can't see that movement because you don't put a line on where it started. It looks like a dead straight ball. So in you know, in here I've got a stripe on the screen there, and I've got guys hitting to the to the stripe. If it doesn't land on that stripe, people aren't satisfied. I know. And, you know, <laughs> six yards straight right, six yards straight left, ten yards straight right, ten yards doesn't matter. That's a straight ball either way. If it has you know very little side spin, and I try to explain to somebody, your club face is square to the direction you're swinging, and it is such a challenge. But when you get somebody to understand that. You've made them a better play. Yes. Re regardless of the equipment, you once they understand that, you're making them a better player. Right. It, it, and it takes a while to to go over it and, and explain it, but you know, 
that's when you start selling lessons and you know start making a living. Well, I get people that might be you know 10, 12, 15, 20 feet right of the stripe, and and they're looking at me like, what's wrong? And I'm they're like, nothing. I love it. I said, you're 20 feet right of the flag. You hit a green. Right. right. There's something you don't do a lot of right. is you, you don't hit greens, right? And, you know, and that's a downside, you know, because like a lot of clubs now have simulators. I know Todd has one over at Burning Tree. You know, Corey has one up at, in Darien on their second floor, which is great because it engages the membership during the winter. But, you know, you got to be you got to be careful like you are with your foresight and your screen there that simulator teaching is is good to be able to have that access, but at the same time, the expectation level of the student is kind of distorted. You know, I think I think you're starting. You'll see players who can play on a simulator better than they can on a golf course. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt. And you know, <laughs> it's funny. You know, they say, "How am I? How am I shoot 90 here, and I can shoot 72 on a simulator?" Uh, it's not quite the same. <laughs> It's not quite the same. No, you're not going out. Uh, here's a question, Paul, from Dan. He said, I've been told that the more flexible the shaft, the higher the ball will fly. I spoke to a champion store player, and he said he always believed this as well as until recently. He said he tried a 7-0 flex shaft instead of a 6-0 shaft, and the 7-0 flex shaft uh, put the ball higher. What are your thoughts on, on shaft flex there? Oh, again, it's it, it's all it's all related to the profile of the shaft. So if you if you call a shaft seven zero, and you measure it on a frequency machine, you you're measuring the frequency of the butt end of that shaft. You're not measuring the tip section of that shaft. So I I think we don't look at frequency so much, or at least I don't look at frequency and flex so much anymore is as much as you look at the profile of the shaft and what its characteristics are. Now, I don't have a shaft profiler. Um, I have a frequency machine, which I rarely use now. Most of what I understand of the shafts are what I do when I hit it. So I'll hit all the shafts. I'll hit everything that TaylorMade's got, everything that Callaway's got, and I'll make notes, hey, when I hit this shaft, it goes lower. Hey, when I hit the shaft, it goes higher. And then knowing how, that, that's how I'm going to fit it into that player's profile. So, so when that player comes in and needs it to go up, I'll say, oh, hit this. It goes to the moon and hit this. And then you've got to look at direction and so forth. So I would say on the whole, usually lighter shafts go higher. What player with a lighter shaft needs the ball to go lower? It really doesn't happen. And then as you usually get heavier, the kick point moves up because that player needs the ball flight to go lower. So in my experience, yeah. Lighter ones, they do, do seem to go higher. And uh, what about distance, as long as we're on the subject of lighter shafts? How do you, do you see a- Lighter lighter doesn't always translate to more speed. No. No. Why Sometimes do you think that you is? Get, uh, well, if you, if you were to pick up a lady shaft, let's say a very flexible um, shaft and swung it, how are you gonna make that go straight? A lightweight, flexible shaft. You're going to have to go slower, right? Right. So I can't, I can't swing as hard as I want at that to get the club face back to square. So now, if I go heavier, now I can swing harder because I know where it is. And sometimes when you give somebody heavier, they'll swing it faster for that reason, just because they know where it is. They have more confidence that they don't have to slow down to square the face. Right. Right. So then again. It provides them, you know, and and one of the things that I've worked a lot on uh, with my students the past couple of years, because I, it's an epidemic of slow swings, like slow is better. And I had a lady in here who travels a lot, belongs to multiple country clubs, plays all over the country, and she started naming all the top 100 golf instructors she's been to which is kind of like the, you know, the Golf Digest and Golf Magazine list. And, I, and so my first thought was like, what am I going to do with her, right? It's like she's had every good piece of information that she could possibly get relative to her swing, and it still hasn't helped. And she had no distance at all. So rather than giving her a 
a skill set to work on, I decided that the only way I could help her was to make her swing faster. And so I, I put all my efforts into doing things to make her swing faster. And what we started to see as she let it go was the faster she could get her club moving, she became more efficient in time. The club before it was performing better. And she was hitting straighter shots. She was hitting longer strokes. And one of the places that she plays is somewhere as a club in Augusta. And Did she you tells use the stack system with her. I have used the stack system with her. Yes. And, and what I would do is I would just take, you know, because there's five different weights with the stack system. And so I would, you know, I just kind of variable weight it with her and have her take different swings and just to, you know, and then I have a little monitor on the floor. And, and so we kind of established a baseline, right? But she was under the impression from all this instruction, because I would say she's over instructed, you know, underplayed. And, but she was under the impression the slower she moved, the more she control her club. And I said, I feel like the faster you move, the better you're going to control your club because you have to be more efficient to move quicker, which is just the opposite of what she was thinking. So right. she, so she goes to this golf course in Augusta. She emails me from there that she's hitting the ball further than she ever has on that golf course. And she not only broke a hundred, but she broke 90 because she could carry the slopes. She said, I get home in a part and par fives. I got, I can get home in regulation now. And there, you know, before I was always laying up, you know, my fourth or fifth shot to the green. So, you know, she's making doubles on par fives. So all we did, and I, I did nothing relative to her swing shape, but as I got her faster and I'd video her swing, her shape got better because she started to get more efficient, but it completely flipped her mindset. And, and so what do you find, like if, if you can get somebody faster, what do you, what do you see with your numbers there off of your foresight? Well, the, the, um, the what's the book I'm reading? Every, every shot counts or something. Yes. And they, um, Mark Brody's. Mark Brody. He, if you can make somebody 20 yards longer, you've made them almost a full shot better. And every manufacturer will, will tell you the, the straighter you get the ball to go, the further it's gonna go. And the more distance you get somebody, they have data to back up. That is the biggest advantage you can give them. Correct. And you know, I and believe that. saying the same thing in his book, the distance is, is such a big advantage to, um, to, to give a player. So I don't know if it, if it you know, in, in that lady's case, it seems to make a lot of sense. Um, you know, what, what are you seeing? It, it's hard to give somebody a club specifically and see it travel faster or, or swing faster. Uh, I would say I'm trying to optimize the speed of the ball would be the bigger, um, the bigger thing I'm trying to accomplish. So, you know, ball speed and spin, apex. <laughs> It's hard for me in an, in an hour long club fitting to um, to see a great gain in speed when you know, no, no, because well, I think speed has to be trained. Like when we talked to Sasha last week, right? Right, right. That's a training process. But it's, uh, I also think that for somebody like you, that's that's a tool in the bag, right? Because I come to you, which which I have, right? I've got X amount of speed, which we're not going to discuss. I want to hit the ball faster or, or further. I need more speed. You did what you could do fitting me with shafts and club head. Now I have got to, I've got to do something to my body to make me stronger, to make me faster. Sure. Right. My easiest lessons uh, are with, you know, younger players who have speed, right? Because now I'm just dealing with maybe contact and curvature. The person without speed, I think, is is difficult to not only to teach, but it's, it's got to be difficult to fit. You know, when you when you see a seventy mile an hour driver speed, and you you look at um, that player, 
they hit a lot of clubs the same distance. Yes. And they're going around the golf course using four clubs, three clubs, and they wonder why they need a full set. Um, they don't. Yeah, it, it's, you know, again, it that would be, um, you know, you're trying to optimize the time in the air for that player usually, and you're limited to what you can even fit them in and sell them in a lot of cases. When I was at the PGA a few years ago, I – I was volunteering time up on the putting green because I wanted to see everybody come through there, right? And so every, you know, every caddy's there with a the bag. So Y.E. Yang was there, who had been the player who won the PGA Championship head-to-head -head against Tiger. You know, he hit that hybrid like 200 yards on the last hole to a couple feet and made the putt. So I go over to his bag, and, and his lowest number iron was a six iron. You're kidding. No, he had multiple hybrids. He had a driver three wood. I asked the caddy and if I could see the hybrids and he showed me his hybrids. So he had multiple hybrids. And then he, he just said that he's always been a great hybrid player and he had confidence because he could do more with a, with a hybrid than he could with a longer iron. And, you know, and he's, he's older now and he's, he's getting that champions tour age. And he just had a lot more, you know, a lot more confidence in his ability to score with, with you know less irons and more hybrids and and play professional golf so yeah uh, how many times do you look at a bag and like you're going like five six iron is the lowest iron um a lot of times you know it's 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 um it's rare to sell a four iron these days to be honest with you if you go through I, again i don't know if you can see this image i have here but if you if you look at the pattern of shots there and there's different apexes of the ball and this is these are all of the drivers um, well, here's one with the iron so this shot here is 35 feet high, or 35 yards high 105 feet 35 35 yards right 105 feet 105 feet so right. i would say for so this is this is would be me Every club I have can go that high. Okay, so there's, At a there's minimum. not a club in my bag that'll be below that, because if it was, I wouldn't deem it to be useful for where, I, for where I'm playing golf. So you're trying to hit every, every club at the, same, at the same height, right across the board, trying to keep everything at the same apex, whether it's 30 yards, the slower club speed is obviously going to be a little lower at the apex. But that's that's where you want to see most every club. Now, when you get to a driver, um, obviously you got to look at that a little bit differently as far as descent goes. But still, you'll see the apexes are all pretty similar, at you know thirty yards, thirty-five yards high, just with less spin. So you're saying so that's your driver profile. Well, this one must be my iron. I think my driver's lower just because all the hits are on the bottom of the club. Yes, if you look at this one at a 12 degree loss, it's 28 yards high. So it's close to 30, 35. And again, it's on the bottom of the club, so there's no loft there. So you're saying like as I go through my bag, like if if my you know, if my seven iron, say my seven iron's 105 feet at apex. And then you go to a six iron, and let's say it goes down to 90, which wouldn't be which wouldn't be too low, but let's say it went to 70 for whatever reason then I would tell you that guy to get a hybrid. And then if the hybrid didn't go high enough, like start looking at 11 wood or a nine wood so he can reach that same apex and follow that. And the club will be, the club will be more useful. The shot will be more useful for that player. Because it's going to have a better because descent. It's, it's going to have a better descent. It'll have a little more spin. It'll go the yardage he expected. You, you give a guy, let's say it's an 11 wood instead of a six iron. He doesn't have to, he'll hit that 11 wood the right distance more often than he will the six iron. Because Probably a better easy. example to say a five hybrid or a four hybrid, but right. uh, than a four iron or a five iron. But if you um, if, if you look at that and, and just look at the distance covered, if Brody's right, if the manufacturers are right, give them the club that covers this, the distance, forgetting direction. You know, from 200 yards away, if the guy's 20 yards off long, who cares? It's better right. than taking out a four iron and hitting it.
one in his right. I mean, he's straight. That's an interesting thought process about the apex. Everybody thinks a wedge. Everything will be about that height. And if you, if, watch, it's... if you if you watch golf on TV, you'll see, you know, when they give you the heights, I love that. You never really know what shot they're trying to play to and wins and so forth. But um, it, it's a good it's a good reference to look at and see what the you know a tour pro or swinging you know a seven iron maybe a hundred miles an hour a little less right. uh, is doing with their trajectory. So you know, this afternoon over at Fenway, Tyler's going to be out there looking at trajectories, and Wendy's going to probably have to be recording all this. You know, when you say Tyler, I I keep hearing Tiger. <laughs> yeah, there's not much difference. <laughs> yeah. Tiger was going to be at Fenway today. <laughs> I what he's still doing here. Yeah, he's going to be at Fenway today. <laughs> Tiger's getting Tiger's getting a lot of information. Everybody's which I don't happening at the masters who goes to the dinner i think phil is suspended is what i think but does that mean he can't go to the dinner oh yeah augusta doesn't want him anywhere near that property. augusta doesn't want him anywhere near there i that would be my take now nobody knows for sure no. but there you know augusta is very big on their rules right like if if you do so, uh, they had a list. I think Golf Digest did a story the last couple of days about people who have have lost the opportunity to be at Augusta. You know, like somebody somebody screenshotted a, a, a picture from the press room, so they took his badge away for one year. I think it was Shipnick did something. You know, the writer, so they took his badge away for one year. You know, obviously, uh, you know, Tiger when he had his little little different his personal difficulties, they gave him a talking to when he did come back to Augusta. So yeah, I. I think Phil's, you know, I, my guess is he's suspended. He's been very quiet. The tour has been very quiet and he's not playing anything, right? He's just like, he's in hibernation. He's, he's gone. I got, I got a guy on the inside here. I just shot him an email. Let's see if he responds while we're. Uh, oh, the guy we're... that might know. Yeah. He, his guy might know. Yeah. The tour never tells you anything, which is, you know, just where they operate, but that's fine. You know, and then. We'll, you know, we'll find out, John. We'll find, we'll find out. <laughs> Your other piece of information that you gave me on a QT was was solid. That, that came was to solid fruition. Income. Yeah, yeah, that was something that nobody in America had. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the go-to on the apex, you could look like a hero with your members when you're fitting them, and you know, and, and if my, you know, if my six iron's not doing what I, it should be, maybe you throw a five hybrid in. You show me the apex, and obviously the apex is going to help my carry distance. Correct. Correct. I always take a ball that's in the air longer is going to go further other than if it's sky. I, you know, I remember when the Callaway Heavenwood came out. Okay. And when a member had a shot from 180, 190 yards, you knew you won the hole if you were playing against them. And when that club came out, now they could not only reach the green, they could hold it, but they could clear a bunker and they'd be pin high chipping. When they, you know, whatever they were using back then, which was a poor hybrid, if they were an iron, they had no chance. So I, I distinctly remember seeing a, a huge difference from, you know, from that club, you know, on the golf course. I, I you know, I, I'll never forget that. That was a great but club. It, it, I it, had that it, conversation it, with somebody the other day about that club because I, it, I do well, remember. It, you know, you, you look, I, you can't believe how many 11 woods I sell and nine woods. I sell because if if the hybrid doesn't reach the right apex, then I go to those, and those will go up, and those will get the those will get the the apex that they need. And guys will always come back and say, "Man, I hit this thing great." So you tell me there's a nine wood in my future? Oh, you'll love it, John. Yeah, you'll I, love it. Yeah, I want to upgrade the shaft though. I want, I want a fancy shaft. Yeah, we'll get some. We'll, we'll okay. put a Ventus in there. Yeah, cool. yeah, exactly. Give me a couple hundred dollar shaft in my nine wood. Just keep the head cover on it, right? So no one sees it. <laughs> but no, if it works, it works, right? Because I can remember back when I was first in the industry, which is you know, a couple of centuries ago, that uh, the the baffler, remember the baffler with the brass sole? Oh, plate? 
Sure. It had a double rail sole plate. Sure. That that was every 25 handicappers go to shot from 150 to 175 yards. What about the Ginty? A, remember the, the Ginty? Ginty? The Ginty was the same way. The Ginty Anthony? was like I can remember those from caddy days when I was a kid. But they uh, they could take every high handicapper and make them look good from 160 yards and in. Yeah, yeah. And and that's it's interesting to see. So have you seen a, a, a resurgence of of higher lofted woods in the last few years? Now that you oh, mentioned absolutely. those, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I for me, I think the launch monitor helps sell it. Because it's you can just, show you can show apex, you can show descent, and then you can show carry distance. And you know when you're looking at ball speed numbers, and you know you you see the say it's the, the five iron. I'm um, saying let's say it's a seven iron, and it carries uh, the ball speed's 100 miles an hour. Well, we know what the ball speed on the next club should be, and if it's if it's 105, um, and and it's supposed to reach a specific apex, you can you can get that number from that next club and show it to somebody. And it's almost like we have to convince somebody to buy a golf club. Oh, I think you do have to convince them, right? I think there's just, there's so much information out there now uh, and be it right or wrong or the interpretation is incorrect. That doesn't seem to, you know, like don't muddy the waters with the facts. But I know a lot of my clients come in with, you know, with so much information, not always correct, but they just, there's a plethora of information out there, you know, due to the internet due to YouTube, due to, you know, different videos that they sure. see, uh, you know, on YouTube with instructions. So uh, I think what's interesting is uh, how many of our, how many of our attendees are carrying, you know, what are the highest lofted woods you're carrying? And, and woods are no longer woods, but I'm referring to them as woods, you know, call them, you know, fairway implements, whatever we want to call them these days. But I mean, you know, what's the highest number of, uh, of a, a wood that you're carrying in your shop. And who, who are you getting your nine and 11 woods from? Who does a good job for you? Um, so, well, Ping makes a, a nine wood. And then so does um, uh, Callaway still has the Epic nine wood that I still have a number of the nines and 11. So those are pretty much it. You know what I'm seeing on, uh, cause I always look what's in the bag on tour. You know, be, uh, because it just interests me what you know what better players are doing. So I always look at that those articles when I when I have the opportunity to see it. And it's interesting to see you know from week to week the number of players that are carrying five woods. Again, that seems they're, they're they're getting it to the right height to use it. They're holding right. greens better with that than they will a, a two or three height. Right, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Um, and I can remember when I was, you know, when I was caddying, you know, the sets used to be like, you know, your, your iron sets and your wood sets always seemed to match way back when, right? Now everybody has, you know, six different brands in their bag uh, be, because, you know, you, you have fitting that you didn't have back then. But you, when you buy a set of woods, you'd always get a 135. That was the go-to. Sure. Head sure. covers were always 135, you know, because you have matching head covers, right? And they yeah, the come sets too, as John. well. Don't, don't forget, they had the diamond. Yes, for whatever the five was, right? Right, they yeah, had the diamond. Yeah, but uh, but I I like, uh, and I'm seeing more and more tour players, and I think Vijay Singh actually carries a seven wood at times, which makes sense, right? Well, Vijay used to have a nine wood. Yes, yes, he, used he did. He a nine wood, and then they said that the face was drilled so far open that it was like a five wood. Because VJ, you know, anti left, and uh, yeah, he used to use a nine wood, reeled open. And I think those are interesting stories, especially for our membership, because you know, obviously every year your membership's you know a year older, and with a year older, they're probably a little bit slower, right? They, you're losing speed, you're losing muscle mass. If you're not offsetting that with some type of strength training, which you know, we found out this winter, we'd, we'd all strongly advocate, right? Something that you know like uh, Sasho does with his uh, stack system. But, you know, the only way you're going to replenish that distance is by getting strong. You know, there's only so much fitting can do, right? There's only so much the golf ball can do. And then it comes down to what? Am I, can I get stronger? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, when guys ask me for more distance, I, 
lot of times I'll say, I, I don't know if you're strong enough to get more distance. Right. I think that's another formula. Some guys have never been in a gym before. And um, yeah, they're just not, not physically strong. It's not just one magic thing. And granted, we're all looking for it, but, um, you know, to, to, to do the stack system, and, um, weight training, I mean, you got to do yes. that stuff. You got to do that stuff, stay alive, John. Well, I know that there are a number of apps out there with fitness. You know, Sasha has one with a stack system. A guy named Mike Carroll has Fit for Golf, which seems to be a very popular app. And he, he does a lot of, you know, free stuff on both YouTube as, as well as the internet. But um, I think that's, you know, that, that fitness aspect along with the club fitting aspect is something that, you know, probably all of us could do a better job of, you know, for our clients. And if you're at a facility where you have a practice facility, you know, you might have some speed training devices out there and, you know, set up a station much like you would any other station, you know, much like you would your wedge station over by your, your, your bunkers, right. With your demo clubs. But I would consider setting up a speed station on the driving range with some tools and, and some signage, you know, um, you know, stop in a golf shop, learn how to use this equipment. Right. Because, for, for no other reason, it's just that, you know, it's another revenue stream. You know, you might be able to, you know, carry some of the stuff in the shop that you'd use in a speed training. And they might not know it's out there, John, either. All right. And, and I think that's, a, that's a big thing too, because I don't have one client that ever comes in that blames their lack of speed or distance on themselves. No one ever comes to me saying it's me. It's always my equipment or it's my swing. Maybe the last time you saw a sit up, you were in grade school, has something to do with it, right? <laughs> right? You know, you know a, kettle, a kettlebell is not a, you know, a bucket of food, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think it'd be very beneficial. And I think like, I, even if you had like a warm up station on your range, right? You know, with a, uh, who is it? The, uh, mm -hmm. oh, the orange ball, the whip, the orange whip. Right. Yep. Yeah, Jim Hackenberg from South Carolina. He has those orange whips. I use those a lot just to warm up. You know, I have one in my, I have two in my bag actually. You know, different lengths, and I use them in my academy too, just as warm up. But you can have like you know a warm up station on your range where you know you have some products over there. Uh, we did a, a seminar earlier this year on uh, the True Turn Pro, which is a device that you know you can make. Uh, turns with you know and get you feel how your back and your rotation of your spine and your pelvis kind of get involved in your golf swing uh, which leads us to your when you're doing your coaching what do you see flaw wise you know when you jump from you know your fitting aspect to your coaching act aspect to get somebody to, to make better motions uh, what do you see do you see an overuse of hands and arms and underuse of the body with most of the people that you you fit yeah i'd say most cases sure it's an epidemic of, of proportions. Of struggle, we see a lot of struggling with balance. And I think that's why they don't want to go to their left side. So they're protecting it by staying back and then just using their hands too much when they swing. I so see that. I see a lot of arm and hand motion. And they, you know, people are using the body more as a platform to swing off of instead of using it. And when you look at better players, you, you, you see a lot of like, especially on the tours with the men and ladies, uh, you know, one that comes to mind is Brooke Henderson, the Canadian lady who I love to watch play, but she just, I saw her in Florida just before the PGA show. And this woman just rips it. It doesn't matter what's in her hand. She rips it. Right. But she's got an intense amount of body movement. And I just never see that with my, my lesser skilled players. And I was wondering, you're seeing the same thing when you're doing your fittings. No, oh, absolutely. And Again, I, you, you see, you know, I see a lot of people. So you see a lot of things. I, I, um, I, I get, nobody properly knows how to, not to say nobody, but a lot of players don't properly engage their lower half for sure. Their legs, their feet. Yeah. Yeah. So there's. The only, the only ground force they have is when the club hits the ground. <laughs> yeah. Very common, yes. Yeah, no. And again, that gets back to training, right? That gets back to stations you could put on the range to help people learn how to move, you know, different, you know, create different patterns. Hmm. 
So what do you think, um, from everything that you see, is there one club in a bag? If you had to replace one club in somebody's bag to make them better player, what would that be? Would that be a T-ball club? Yeah, I'd say it'd have to be. It would have to be, how do you get the, the tee shot to go the furthest? It'd have to be, based on just the numbers. Right. Right. I'd like to think you'd, you'd give somebody a different putter and they'd become a better putter and make more putts. Um, but again, I don't think a lot of people realize they have 38 putts in a round of golf. Yeah, putter, putting, you know, which I do a lot of is, is, you know, fairly low hanging fruit, right? You know, the biggest thing in putting I've seen is make people better 10 feet and in and create better lag putting so that they don't three putt. Great. You know, uh, putting's just not fun. Nobody likes to, you know, nobody likes to grind the putter, right? It's more fun to hit. No, nobody works at it. And, you know, people don't understand, you know, proper green reading. Uh, so many times when I'm doing these clinics and, and doing putting, everybody tells me how bad their stroke is, which, you know, a lot of times it, it needs help, but it's just like, you know, very few people can read a green properly. Most people under read. And then when they under read, they don't start the ball high enough. And then the ball rolls down the slope. And instead of being, you know, a, a two foot, three foot tap in, you know, it rolls down the slope five, six, eight feet. And again, there we are inside 10 feet. And, you know, and just, you know, people are, people are, are bad inside 10 feet, right? I, I saw some questions come up, John. Did we answer all the questions? Uh, Tyler had another one there. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if it's crazier to me to bend my irons nine flat. They're already four flat. Nine flat. Tyler, are you still on? He just he just wrote, no, I'm good. Yeah, that was something else there. Um, Tyler's a good player, obviously. He's a good ball striker. Uh uh, one thing I would I would tell you I see is better players have flatter lie angles. I have all my wedges flattened out. I love flatter wedges. What's the most that you would you ever bet a good player's you know uh, normal set? Oh God! How far would you go? Probably I'd probably bet close five degrees flat for somebody. Sure. Five degrees. Sure. All right, so Tyler can add one, and no, Tyler, minor, you're not crazy. Minor, minor three, um, I, and I think at times they need to be four degrees flat just to just to put the club level to the ground. And obviously, that helps you with not hitting left. Oh, it's you know when I pick up a club in here, you know, a standard lie angle club, I'm holding it off not to hook it. Right. So, you know, at least I can, when I have a club that's flat enough, um, I can, I can make a swing and, um, and release it and not worry about it going left. So, so you're fine. Again, with I, I think it, it's got a lot to do with the flight that you, that you want, you know, in, in, as far as how, um, upright you might make it for somebody or, um, or, or flat, but you know, for, for a better player to be flat, I, I wouldn't be concerned about it. I think that's where the better players are. So you have his no hand, problem cheating. Hand, you know, I would, I would say, I, 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 if I were him, I would, I would probably film myself and see where I am uh, at impact and measure that angle at impact. If it, if it comes up at fifty six degrees, then that's probably what his lie angle should be. Uh huh. So and it, you and would, it probably is. All right. So you're saying use impact angle to help you with lie angle. I would digital digitally look at it on video right. and then put a line on it and see where that, that number is. You know, years ago before I had this equipment, that would have been the way that I, I when I had video, I would use video and um, that's how I would fit lie angle. I would go to impact, measure the angle, and then build a club based on that. I used to hear tour players talk about that all the time, right? I uh, 
growing up in the industry, I was fortunate enough to be at clubs that hosted different tour events. And so I had a lot of exposure. And then I worked for the, for the tour down at CPC uh, Sawgrass for a period of time. And, and back then, we didn't have the technology that we have today. But you'd be down on the range hitting balls or talking to a tour player. And they'd always be talking about certain clubs in their bag that they felt they just it was the best club in my bag. Like my six iron was the best club in my bag. And so what they would do then is they would spec out all their clubs according to that six iron. Right. And, you know, that that uh, and back then everybody had lead tape. Right. They just taped the hell out of them. You never knew the name of the clubs because there was lead tape on the toes, on the heels, on the back. Right. You remember them, you know, on the back of drivers a lot. You know, back when you had persimmon, there was always people putting tape on sole plates. But, you know, so the better players in, in the history of the game have always known from feel what clubs are performing best. Now, you know, from obviously from data that you can collect. And then yeah. make the adjustments accordingly. Sure, absolutely. You know, you have the, the devices to measure them, too. So you can look at low offs. Um, you can, you know, a lot of times somebody will come to me and say, you know, I have an eight iron that goes further than everything else. And then when you measure the loft and you see that the loft is where it's supposed to be, then when you watch it on a launch monitor and you see where the player makes content mm -hmm. and how they um, hit that shot. The doorbell. And how they hit the, how, they might be turning an eight iron into a seven iron as they swing it. So you right. could, again, that'd be something you could see on a launch monitor. Right. And it might be a, might be a seven iron spec wise too. It's just well, like I said you you can measure that and you can see if, if it's if you know the, the loft is you know the, the four degree five degree gapping whatever you're looking for, and he's still hitting it that club further, then you can you can start looking at a launch bar and say oh when you hit an eight iron you turn it into a seventeen degree launch angle. It seems to me that it would be a great idea to put a loft live machine right in your golf shop, bolt it to the floor, right? Oh, right in the middle. I'd put it right in the middle of the driving range, too. So everybody have to walk around it? Well, they just say walk around, just say at least ask the question of, right. of what, you know, it's there for. And if you can, um, if you can get, uh, you know, just raise the question, oh, what's that for? Oh, it's for well, checking off the lines. Well, what do you mean? Well, let's grab your wedges and then go through. Look, this is supposed to be 58 at 60. Yeah, it always comes up short. Bang, bend it. Eight bucks. Done. Cash. And and what like Tyler was talking about, right? You you can fix your ball flight with your lie angle, and which is what you do. I, I right? just, for, you for me personally, I do, sure. Yeah. But so I, you, again, it's still it's still the club is still presenting itself level. So right. That is that is why part of the reason I'm doing it as well. But uh, well, it's a bigger portion of the reason i think if i was any more upright like i said when i put a standard lie angle club a longer club in my hand man it, i can feel the heel catching the turf and the thing zipping left so you have no chance i have no chance so are all your irons three flat yeah pretty much all right and what do you do what about your driver what about your fairways um so what about your nine wood adjust, there's not much adjustability to those as far as bending them for me so um my three would i play a little shorter so i play it a half inch shorter to make it a little flatter that's an idea so I'm, I'm i'm not very good with a three wood off the fairway but I, I really never hit it that often off the fairway but um off the tee uh i hit it i hit it well off the tee with the three wood All right and then uh, what do you do driver wise? How flat can, and why don't they make flatter drivers? You know, Mike Manavian and I talked to Cobra once about making a run of drivers that were uh, significantly flatter. Right. And it, we both committed to saying, yeah, we'll both buy 30 of them or whatever, whatever we want us, we'll both get them. And then it never materialized to ever happen. It wasn't such a big expense either to do it. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's to force the ball more left in, in the design. I really don't know the answer. It's something we should ask Marty. That's the one yeah, we're also so upright. Right. 
but especially mine for is, better. Uh, saw the image there. Mine's I don't know. It's eight nine degrees off all the time. I have a I have a flatter hosel um, in it to help, but I mean it's not you know it's one. It's not flat enough. Flat. No, it's not, not flat enough. So in in your particular driver, what would you like to see? How much flatter do you feel would be helpful? I don't know if it would be helpful, but I, I guess I'd like to see if, if it was uh, another five degrees flatter. I'd like to Early. see what the ball flight looked like from there, yeah. Interesting. Because I, I would imagine back in the, you know, in the persimmon days, you know, you drilled everything. So that was just a matter back, of putting it back on. Back in the persimmon days, you were two, you were two degrees or uh, you were two inches shorter too. Yes. Two and a half. Right. Right. Yeah, you were, and a half, two and a half, you were 43. You, you were 43, correct. So that made it play flatter. Um, much flatter. All right. And I don't know if now you can give up that much that much length on a driver shaft without negatively affecting distance. But that's a good idea with Marty. I'll uh, I'll email Marty and find out. Yeah, I'd be curious to know the answer to that. Yeah, because I always I always thought that you know flatter would work well. You know, because again, you're you can flatten everything else right in the bag, but you can't flatten you know the woods and the hybrids and yeah, the driver as much. Not, there's not as much leeway there. Oh. Right to do that. So what do you uh what are you looking for going forward club wise? What would you like to see the industry? You know, in addition to you know flatter fairway woods and drivers and so forth, what would be you think helpful? I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I want to see, John. Is I want to see a ball that goes further. You want to see the ball goes further. I want to see a non-conforming ball. And For the I average like, person. And then I would like the USGA to add a club to to the matrix. So give everybody fifteen clubs. Then everybody's got to buy a new bag. They got to buy another club. It would just stimulate the growth. Of, of, of the industry. Be good for ball sales, club because sales, bag sales. More clubs, bags would go up. Um, but if you made a ball, I, I would love to see a guy who hit the ball, you know, 200 yards. If you could give him a ball that went 250 yards and then he can play against me now from the same tee. You know what a thrill that'd be for that guy? Well, it. what would it hurt, right? What would it hurt? It wouldn't hurt. That's a great idea. I like that he, idea. He doesn't. He doesn't have to turn. The, he doesn't have to turn it in. Right. Right. And then you could have, you know, and you could handicap accordingly for tournaments, right? Because there's probably not one member at one club throughout the entire metropolitan section that wouldn't mind hitting the ball twenty to thirty yards further. Yeah. And, and you think of. Are there more golfers that don't have handicaps than do? So, so who cares if they're turning in the score or not? Is there, well, those people aren't turning in the score anyway. And it would add to the enjoyment. Play more golf. You don't think a guy played more golf if he had it 50 yards further? I would. Of course you would. Of course you would. Why wouldn't you, right? Of course you would. It'd be more well, fun. Not only that, but look at speed of play, how that would pick up, right? Instead of hitting, you know, five and six irons, you're hitting eight and nine irons. You got sure. a better chance to hit greens. Sure, you hit, you hit more chips eventually. And pitches, sure. I wonder how popular that would be. I don't know why. I don't like. I don't like. Titleist doesn't do it. No, no. You. That's the one you'd expect to do it, right? Right. Of course. What's the difference if the ball's not conforming, right? I don't think it really makes a difference. You can no, have I... events. At the, you can have events at the club with that ball. Right. You could have non-conforming events. Non-conforming events. Right. And and so the guy had already hits it a long way. He just hit it further. So so it's pretty much equal playing ground, right? Yeah. I um uh, I think at the tour it's level it's one thing, but at the amateur level, it's you know, and which is what we're most concerned with because that's who our clients are. It's yeah. entirely different ball wax. Uh, swing weight, Ryan George over at Rockaway, right? Uh, Swing weight, how have, what do you consider swing weight uh, doing a fitting? You're using your swing weight machine a lot? Well, I mean, is he talking about swing weights or are you talking about lead sinkers where you fish? 
Which, which one is he referring to? Well, he can do both because he's right there on the water. So I'm going to go with his uh, job, right? I'm okay. going to go with uh, swing weight to win his golf clubs, right? Not not what he does after hours. I thought fishing was his job. So the well, um, that so as, be, as far uh, as swing weights go, oh, I'll I'll. I'll use I'll use lead tape a lot of times when I'm using shorter clubs. So I'll just um, I'll bring it up to the different swing weights. You have some of the tools from the manufacturers. I have this one on my deck that um, Taylor made sent me for um, for the drivers. So I'll I'll, I'll move weights in and out, um, and I have a number of different aftermarket ones of different weights. So when I do a final build. I'll um, I'll switch them out. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, I'll, I'll use swing weights. I'm not, um, you know, it's funny. I can't tell you how many times I give somebody a club that's lighter, and then somebody will say it's heavier, and then you give somebody something's heavier, and they'll say it's lighter. And not just from a swing weight standpoint, but a a total weight standpoint. And you know, I, I understand the clubs feel different. You have um, you know, less weight in the middle, more weight in the middle, and more head weight. It feels heavier to somebody in, in some different ways. But it, it, it's funny, you know, people say, match the weight of this club to this club. And I'll go, this one's already heavier. And they go, what? Well, I don't want it any heavier. And I'm, well, that's what you have here. So it's hard with you, what you, what you feel sometimes. Right, because obviously the, you know, the swing weight's not necessarily the feel weight. Right. And then, you know, to answer Ryan's question, maybe further, you know, in, if I have a player, I'm going an inch short on that set of irons. Um, a lot of times I have to take that set apart and, and reweight them, um, you know, in the final product, because some of the companies aren't using different weight heads. Um, so sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll have to do that for that player too. When you when you tear those apart, do you find different companies just jamming stuff down the shaft? Not not down the shaft. Um, different companies have um, you know different weights that they add, so they you know they want the five iron or head a specific weight for a specific shaft, and I'm sure that the the heads that they're getting now aren't subject to the quality control that they were in the past. Oh, I'm sure of that. <laughs> so I, I would, you know, I would venture to guess that seeing more weight, you know, added down shafts to get swing weights where they want them. Uh, right. Because they're just not going to refuse the heads at this point. No, they cannot. They cannot they, refuse they, the heads I don't, at I don't see that. how they can uh, say no to some of the stuff. Okay, Liz? Yeah, there, there's no doubt about that, you know, and and uh, and when you talked about uh, Ryan fishing, he started laughing because uh, I was out there last fall, and it's just it's just crazy on a on a non weekend day. It's just crazy how many people like everybody I talk to says, you know, like Friday's the new Saturday, right? So now you know with these hybrid work schedules that everybody but the golf professional seems to have. It's just that, you know, Fridays are just the, you know, and now it's, a, that's the new weekend day, right? Weekends start on Friday and they seem to end on Tuesdays. Nice. Um, I know a lot of guys that I talk to, their, their, their companies are requiring three days a week if they can get it. So a lot of guys are doing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And I have a number of clients. I said, so that gives you like Friday through Monday. Well, I said, Friday's a golf day. Right. I'll do a little work in the morning, then I play golf. And then Monday's an outing day. And I said, and then, you know, during, over the weekend, I'll try to play once or twice, depending on what's going on at home with, you know, the family and if I can get out. So it's just like, you know, uh, I was talking to Rob out at Sands Point and he says, you know, I, at nine o'clock in the morning, he says, you know, they don't run tea times. You got, you got seven or eight groups headed to the first tee and all but one of them's happy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just like the, you know, the, the numbers off the, you know, play records for every golf professional in the section are just crazy. You know, anywhere from, I've heard anywhere from 15 to 30, 35%. Yeah. You know, yeah. because people have so much time and they're not coming to the city like they, you know, for all those clubs that had members in the city, a lot of these guys are hybrid now, right? And they're just doing two, three, three days a week. 
But I would expect this entire season to continue like it has for the past couple of seasons. You know, pandemic yeah, I seems. Think, to I don't be see play most... going down this year. No, no, yeah. I think it's going to be mean, busier than ever. The, the people I had a guy said he was playing yesterday. I mean, are you kidding me? Yeah, that person <laughs> that yeah he was obviously off his meds. I mean, they can treat stuff like that. That's your wife's a doctor, you know. They can. There's treatment for that kind of situation. Yeah. I was out at Griffith Harris yesterday, and it was like there were snowflakes when I got out of the car. Yeah, I went, out to, I went out to see Pat, and uh, you know, he was he's kind of getting ready for season like everybody else. But yeah, I see the play numbers going up again this year because my clients in the city just aren't coming in. Everybody's working from home. They get more done in less time, like in five or six hours at home, they get done what they used to get done in eight, 10 hours in the city. And they've eliminated anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a week travel time. You know, good for golf, bad for Metro North, right? Well, Metro North, same thing. So uh, how about you and your club? When's your club open up? Uh, our club's open. Okay, so you're already Silver open. Mine. Silver Mine is open. Um, they have, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it was open yesterday or the last, or even today because of the cold, but uh, there's no carts, but uh, soon enough we'll be out there playing. All right. And what about your golf season? You're going to try to play a little more this year? <laughs> I don't think anybody cares, but um, I do. I like to think. I like to think I am. All right, because I know you didn't play much last year. You're so busy. Uh, uh, there was a comment here by Bill that he uh, he liked the idea of having these non-conforming ball events. And it, you know, he said every one of his members would wake up happy with another 20 to 30 yards overnight. It would be a daydream. Let's make it happen. Let's, we'll talk to Marty, right? He doesn't make balls. No, I know, but Marty has a lot of contacts in, in that world. Yeah. Yeah. He has a lot of contacts. We should talk to Jay Hill too, can, right? Can you imagine can you imagine handicapping somebody that way? What's so the now, difference? Oh, what I, would you do? So Paul hits it 50 yards past you. Here's a 50 yard ball for you. Now you so now you know you're 50 yards different. Now you're even with them. Now you go play them with that ball. There you go. Well, so you're 100 yards behind him, you get a hundred yard ball. That'd be, yard ball. That'd be fantastic. You wouldn't need your driver anymore. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I love that idea. That's the best yeah. idea I've heard in a long time. That's why I like to do seminars, right? There's always something that comes out of seminar that has appeal. I think it'd be fun for, I, for the club I, still had, I think I was the, the Met, um, uh, unofficial Met page there on Facebook. Uh, somebody was asking about a um, a GPS system to put under your grips or something for golf clubs, for demo clubs. And, right, so they could track them. Yeah, and, I, and I, I was wondering if the Arcos could do that. And I think he reached out to him. I, I didn't hear what the result was, but um, if you had, you know, then I started thinking, well, gee, if I ever shipped my clubs and I could track where they were, is that a possibility to do something like that? And I can find out where they were as I shipped them to go somewhere. I think that'd be fantastic. And you could find out where they are when they didn't arrive. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty cool idea now that you just mentioned that. I don't see why they can't, right? I, I, would it have to be something that's always on to do that? I don't I don't know. It's for, uh, like I said, the, the Arcos, I would think then you could sell a grip, you know, with that on there instantly. Wasn't Cobra doing that? With their driver grip, where you could uh, tag it up to a app on your phone and yeah, get data. So Ar Arcos made that grip, right? And then Arcos has a grip with Ping, where they already have all that in place. Like, right. I keep doing it. Yeah, you're just popular. Or somebody needs a DoorDash. You got to deliver oh, somebody, some food, right? The front door, probably. Let me in. Okay, here's another question for you. Uh, do you ever fit a strong, fast speed player, somebody who has a high club head speed, to a graphite iron shaft because it may feel better than a heavier steel shaft? 
Um, you know, I, I just built a set with a, a steel fiber 95 gram chaffer player. And the reason being, he has problem in his joints. So his elbows bother him, hits a lot of balls on mats. Someone's at the front doorbell. And for that reason, um, I get, and, and I think he swung too hard for them. But they are, you know, we are going an inch long at that point. Um, so we can look at that as extra weight as well. Um, so the answer is yes. I mean, there, there's heavier graphite shafts too that are an option. So there's, there's, um, there's, there's graphite shafts that are over 100 grams that you could put somebody in. But would I put it in because of from a feel standpoint? You know, feel is the F word. So it's hard to measure feel. If somebody likes it, make it. They're not buying a timeshare, they're just buying a set of golf clubs. So, yeah, if somebody wants to try from a field standpoint, I suppose you could do it. I mean, I suppose I've done it. The quality of the shafts, you know, with graphite compared to what it was years ago is so much different now, right? You have all these oh, different yeah. compounds. Yeah, there's there's definitely um, there's definitely good graphite shafts for iron sets that you could use. Again, you, for that guy who's swinging faster, I think I'm putting guys in that graphite for the, I don't want to make a golf club that's going to break. Let's put it that way. All right. So if, if, you know, that guy has a six degrees downward attack, hits balls off a mat a lot, and he's swinging a, a seven iron 90 miles an hour, and he wants graphite at 75 grams, 65 grams, I'm not going to be responsible for it because I think it's going to break. Because of all the different things that are going on in his golf swing. Well, again, he's, he's six degrees down. We're hitting some, off something hard with that right. much speed. That's a lot of pressure on the tip end of that shaft. Yeah, he's and, coming uh, back, right? He's That's going that's that's to that's eventually snap. I don't just fit clubs. I fix clubs. And I right. fix a lot of clubs. And I see a lot of broken clubs from, um, from guys hitting off max, maybe from – from people that are swinging too hard for that club. Um, I see a lot of bent lightweight steel shafts, again, for the same reason. Um, so yeah, so like I said, it, to me, the club is fit properly if it stays together too. Exactly, All right. But you, you always like to see somebody walk in with a golf club in two pieces from a personal standpoint. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's good for, it's good yeah. for all right, so I don't see any more questions there, Paul. I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate oh, it. Great. Yeah. Tell Lucy we appreciate her uh, behaving so well as she always does. You know. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's a good puppy. And uh, hopefully, I get up to see you soon. We have some lunch, and we get to play a little more golf this season we have in the past. Great. I hope I was helpful. I, you have been great ideas. I want to thank everybody for tuning in this morning. I want to appreciate Paul's time. And hopefully you got something out of it. The whole idea of doing these seminars is that, you know, if you can take one or two things away from it this morning to, to help you going forward, obviously, you know, we, we did our job. And what I took away this morning is uh, lofted fairway woods are becoming more and more popular and obviously a, a good substitute for the longer arms that, you know, the aging population has, has a problem hitting. Uh, I love the golf ball idea of, of somebody making a golf ball to go further because I think it'd be fun. I think every club would would carry them and, and you know, and if they don't fit into all of your tournaments, they certainly could fit into special events where, you know, it's just have as much fun as you can by going out to play golf. And wouldn't that be a new concept for everybody, right? And instead of being so serious about it. So thank you for attending tomorrow. For those of you can get free, we're up at the Golf Performance Center. And then uh, in two weeks, we have our educational uh, forum over at Westchester Country Club. It's a full day affair. We've never done anything like this in the past. So please try to carve out some time on Tuesday, April 12th, which is Tuesday after the Masters and come join us. Thank you and everybody have a warm day as warm as can be, and hopefully your seasons are about to get underway. Take care.